Okay, um, welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to have Umut Korkut with us at the Center for Critical Democracy Studies at the American University of Paris. Um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with uh, Professor Korkut's work, uh, both um, his book that focuses on politics and gender in, in Turkey, and in particular, uh, uh, if uh, a Foucauldian analysis of, of the sermons um, that, uh, that he was able to study uh, through ethnographic and uh, discursive research. Professor Korkut is also uh, quite well known for his uh, the, the wide range of uh, Horizon and other European grants he has received. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him on one of those entitled DRAD. Uh, and this, this book fits in sort of into that um, constellation of work that, that Umut has been doing around questions of, uh, of, of at once cosmopolitanism, questions of, of gender, questions of radicalization, questions of uh, political uh, extreme discourse. And so this, in, uh, it's, it, you know, I think people who are familiar with uh, Professor Korkut's work have been very excited to see this book come out, uh, a book that he wrote or uh, edited with uh, James Foley. And so thank you for joining us, Umut, and we're looking very forward to hearing about the book. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Steve. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure, obviously, as usual, to be in Paris since Wednesday. Um, we've been having various events around you know, DRAD, um, launching the policy and the legal framework reports yesterday online, and um, a, a great uh, guest lecturer from Italy, Professor Anello, um, last night and then this morning visiting the space for our DRAD exhibition that's coming uh, next April, and then now closing this amazing visit with this book launch. It's, it's my great honor, really. And thanks very much for giving me this opportunity. So, what, what is this book about? Um, if I may just say a few words, a few words about it. Um, a few projects back, we started working on uh, on migration. In fact, respond uh, the first Horizon 2020 project that I won was um, in a way the mother of all these projects that came afterwards. Uh, it was a project that was looking into multi-governance of uh, migration in Europe and beyond, as we said, because it was referring to um, uh, various Middle Eastern countries as well as European countries and the Mediterranean countries. Um, and there's just one thing, actually. Can you check my email? Because some, some emails are coming, I think, yeah. maybe from people. Um, so if you keep an eye, then you can respond to them. Sure. So, yeah, so RESPOND actually started as a project on multi-level multi governance of migration in Europe and beyond, as I said. And we decided to study Europeanization in that perspective and migration management with following various trajectories, all the way from where the migrants have started their journeys and then you know, where, where, they, where they came in the end, at the end of their journeys. So the project started, you know, looking at, at the border, border management and security, security policies at European borders. And from there, um, we shifted our focus to protection and reception regimes. And finally, there was the integration uh, work package. And that came, my, the work package that I was uh, co-leading with my colleague, uh, the Ursula Rega, in, in Vienna, um, which was looking into uh, Europeanization. Uh, Europe, a question of Europeanization and conflicts about around Europeanization to do with uh, the challenges that the uh, irregular uh, external migration has posed. So the focus had been then, but to take um, the macro, macro politics of European integration and migration management, and to take it all the way down to understand actually how micro politics mm. were being figured around, you know, migration policies and migration politics in various uh, European countries. So um, that, that's, in fact, you know, my main uh, interest in, in political science, um, as we had you know, long discussions last night, how a micro, micro, micro politics operate in, in everyday. So in a way, I was interested in tracing this uh, everyday Europeanization and the conflict that it, it, was, it was posing around the issue of irregular migration. 
Um, in order to achieve this thing, we had a few countries under the focus of this work package. Um, uh, Hungary was the, was the country that I was leading because you know, uh, my first book came on Hungary and I speak Hungarian. And we had Austria, uh, we had uh, Greece, we had Poland, uh, we had Germany, um, we had Sweden, and that was all of, that was about it, I presume. And Italy. So th those are the seven countries where we were studying. Um, for that purpose, we collected uh, macro narratives of migration and Europeanization from the European elites. And we, we traced those debates through uh, what we call the mesosphere, and that was the newspapers. And we, we tried to understand how those narratives were were mediated, uh, were, were have become resonant, were reflected in, uh, the, in, the, in the newspapers. And from there onwards, we were going to put it in uh, various citizen bodies through what we call then migration governance networks mm. in these countries. And we were going to take them through a focus group, the, proposing that practically what, what they've been hearing in the media and then see how they were negotiating their identities vis-a-vis -vis the migration narrative that was being built around you know, external migration and COVID event. So we could not really do this micro element all that well because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but we, what we did instead uh, it was we issued um, a set of questions to the people that we interviewed uh, from uh, various NGOs and interest groups who were dealing with the protection and reception and integration um, policies uh, within these countries. And we treated them as citizens in turn in order to see how they would reflect to the macro narratives that we were finding as a citizen to see practically how they were negotiating once again with the macro levels of Europeanization vis-a-vis -vis how they experience Europeanization in their, their, in their every day. So for us, that became this macro, micro kind of um, communication in terms of uh, the narrative becoming resonant and the narrative finding it, its audience. So as we were bringing a response to a close, and it was a fascinating and extremely exciting project, um, it was my first uh, uh, Horizon project, as I said, um, and there came into office a new European Commission. And they came with this ridiculous idea of you know, trying to define European values and then trying to defend you know, European lifestyle around, around European values. So that became uh, in a way kind of funny because I started to question actually what the European values would be or should be. And then what's it there to defend, what's there to protect, and how can you really build an identity around such liberal cosmopolitan uh, process of, of integration that has happened in, 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 in the Europe, in European Union thus far. I mean, you may remember in France, it was kind of a lot more tangible in 2005, the European constitution debates. I don't know whether anyone remembers this uh, any yeah. longer, right? Yes. So this uh, European constitution framework, which brought, was well, again, the, the existing EU countries, that was 50 with the accession countries, and then it also included Turkey. That was a preamble to the European constitution. And there was this whole debate uh, in early 2000s, you know, regarding like this, the secular dimension, whether it should mention any Judeo-Christian dimension, you know, to what extent, you know, European constitution and European identities and values at that stage should relate to the history of the European continent and European civilization can be defined, all that. But I mean, those debates, they took place in this kind of euphoria moment in European politics. Right, because it was right after the end of the Cold War kind of prosperity, where you know, we were still uh, enjoying this post materialist politics, which has started in, in, in Europe uh, after 1960, 1970. And it reached a certain culmination, in fact, in, in discussions and debates around European enlargement. So that, that, that was uh, the context where European constitution came into existence. And then what happens is that you know, there's a referendum and it is rejected. Um, not only here, but also in Netherlands. And then before it goes on further, then third countries, they start to pull back the referendum and then the European constitution really simply died. And from there onwards, a technical uh, treaty has, has taken the shape of um, the Lisbon Treaty, which even that struggled to get uh, confirmation uh, when it was taken to, to the public was in Ireland um, 
uh, if you remember. So for me, actually, as a student of European politics, let's say, that was the culmination of practically the, the end of this euphoria, let's say, this liberal integration uh, model um, that, that took shape or, and that was affecting the course of European integration, which just started, let's say, from the beginning um, until the early, early 2000s. And from then onwards, we started to see that one crisis after another. What is really interesting is that the European elite had been really adamant to present the European Union as this you know, success story of stability and continuity, right? Um, a success story of building um, uh, this continent of peace and all that. But since 2008, there have been so many crises in Europe. You, you start with the economic and financial crisis, then um, you talked about the migration crisis, although it was really the crisis of the people who were coming here rather than these poor Europeans um, themselves, what I, I, I prefer calling actually, you know, due to the abrupt increase of the irregular migrants coming to Europe rather than this you know, influx of refugees as, as it has become in common, common slang. So that was, uh, that was the second one, the, the, the migration issue, let's say, and then came uh, the climate change. It's an issue and it, it demands a response from the European Union. Then it then happens and all of a sudden very, very fast, right? The war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, um, you know, simply all these crises taking part, in fact, within 15 years or so. And this is really, and you may also take Brexit because it, it went to show that a country, a European country yeah. and a major European country, you know, the second biggest economy, second biggest army, however you want to call it, simply left the European Union, right? So that all these crises created a certain bomb explosion to do with the liberal course of European integration. And that's the reason why I think we have to reinterpret their European uh, life uh, style agenda that came out with the Ursula von der Leyen uh, Commission in 2019, who are we? And I don't think that you know that question was uh, the same as the European Constitution debate in 2005 because that was you know in, in, in the sense of euphoria, but the 2019 "Who are we?" question was really in, in terms of this protectionism, and that now we have to defend ourselves yeah. in order to, we have to consolidate ourselves uh, without you know, going any in, in, in further beyond than what we have achieved thus far. So the, this book actually. Um, corresponded to that time, to the, to the time of the coronavirus, to the time when Britain was uh, finally and eventually leaving the European Union, even coming to the end of its transition period, etc. And we we based in Scotland, and Scotland had a, an overwhelming, uh, in comparison with England at least, uh, vote uh, to remain in the European Union, Scottish nationalism debates, um, the mis mismanagement of the coronavirus uh, governance, in all around, but I'm including uh, the EU proper, etc. And uh, James Foley, my co-author, and myself, we started to ask ourselves practically, you know, there's a big contestation going on here, but the contestation is not necessarily contesting Europe because that's what the populist parties have done already. But now the contestation is about <clears throat> contesting cosmopolitanism that had been a part of the liberal agenda of, of European Union. So this is really beyond, you know, what we what we've been used to in terms of European skeptic parties, Marine Le Pen. In, here you talk, you know, Viktor Orban that we talk uh, in, in Hungary, but now actually the, the center right um, the parties and politicians they were questioning and they were contesting uh, uh, Europe, and we were very happy that um, uh, Amsterdam University Press gave us this chance and they hosted us in their um, uh, in their book series on mobilization, um, which uh, would have other, otherwise around you know, social movements, right? But they were happy to accommodate um, a book that looked into a more philosophical and uh, ideological contestation. And then they also considered it, it relevant to the book series in terms of you know, contestation and mobilization does not necessarily happen thanks to or through the means of social movement, but it can also happen through the insiders. So this is a book about you know, the, how the in insiders started to, to contest the idea of European integration. Right? So that is how practically we came uh, to this book uh, with uh, my very, very good friend um, uh, and colleague, uh, Dr. James Foley. 
Um, so in terms of context and cosmopolitan Europe, you know, we thought that there's something that's happening at the borders that was very clear because it was a you know, European whatever agenda and uh, secretization of migration management around the European external borders and there is um, sovereignty issues imposed on countries around European borders in terms of how they should manage external migration and all that, but also crises. I mean, you know, in a continent of uh, stability and success as it is taught by the elites, crisis were, uh, it was a crisis that was setting the terms of debate. Uh, you know, Brexit, you know, once again, financial crisis, coronavirus crisis, but the crisis one after another, right? So we thought that um, Euroscepticism had been uh, interpreted and had been understood as an expression of a political ideology by certain political parties thus far. But actually, Euroscepticism had been rather imminent and integral part of the insiders of European Union if we approach it from the, the, the perspective of cosmopolitanism. And that's why we thought that um, Euroscepticism has gone beyond the, the, the usual suspects. And through um, the means of crisis, crisis and you know, borders, Euroscepticism had turned into questioning the, um, uh, the integral aspects, the main tenets, tenets, the essential elements of European integration at the heart of which is cosmopolitanism. So that is how we came uh, to this book uh, as an idea and how this book is organized. Now, we, we, we do not want to be reticent in terms of what we uh, want to, to uh, integrate um, into this book in terms of its geographical scope, in terms of its um, uh, methodologies, in terms of you know, various, um, uh, various approaches to, to, to study social sciences. So the book covers um, a, a wide array of studies all the way from uh, legal psychological approaches to studying solidarity and European belong and, and belonging to European Union to all the ways you know, to study um, how Turkish Syrian border management operates in a way to protect Europe from external threats. So we took uh, the book uh, offers um, a, a wide array of uh, approaches from law, psychology, political science, spatial planning, geography, uh, as well as taking the discussion from geographical space to digital space. Um, and there's a, there's a chapter from uh, my very, very good friend, once again, and colleague, as well as my PhD student, Özge Özdezan and uh, Bogdan Yanashev, um, looking into how the digital sphere itself turned into a field of contestation and how through sarcasm, actually people were committing, let's say, anti-cosmopolitan acts against the Syrian migrants while using you know, uh, social media as their instrument. The book also looks into you know, various uh, other countries within the European Union. So excuse me, it looks, it looks at uh, Greek politics, it looks at you know, how the combination of various crises in Greece affected their approach to cosmopolitan Europe. It looks into Austria and how Austrian politics uh, were organized as a response to uh, irregular migration and how it left a legacy in terms of uh, Austrian you know, more or less consociational um, politics that, that Austria had uh, during 1970s, 1980s, etc., whereby contestation was always consociational settled and how an issue such as migration simply leaves all that legacy behind and then creates this, this contestation mm. that, that becomes uh, un unresolvable you know, because there's an identity element there. We also wanted to question um, such, let's say, Eurosceptic countries in the traditional sense, such as the United Kingdom, Hungary, and Poland, in terms of the protection regime that they were putting in place and how contestation was getting uh, pretty much embedded in their uh, otherwise uh, international treaty-based uh, responsibilities. Uh, which is you know, protection towards uh, irregular migrants. So we wanted to understand how you know, a pan-European, let's say, sphere of contestation was coming into existence uh, all the way from the UK to, to Eastern Europe and how you know, protection regimes and protection policies uh, of these countries were, um, were being formulated uh, as a result. So um, there is a, there's a, there's a chapter uh, on, um, the, on solidarity as such, uh, it is uh, it is the opening chapter actually from uh, my colleague Martin McGuirgenson from Albuquerque University, and um, that chapter itself, you know, 
takes the issue of, issue of solidarity and its contestation, and he approaches the issue from the perspective of, uh, of cosmopolitanism. So um, there are quite a few uh, chapters, as I said uh, in the book, but not to forget about, obviously, um, a, a chapter on Scotland. Um, it's a live a life for us that, that, that had become the Scottish narrative during uh, the UK's departure from uh, the European Union. And we were interested in how uh, Scottish nationalism was in a way exploiting cosmopolitanism in order to put, in order to put an anti-England uh, kind of picture or anti-England kind of politics um, during the course of, uh, of Brexit. So uh, finally, um, there is a concluding chapter from uh, James Foley uh, and myself reflecting on the issues that we raise in the book and then looking beyond uh, um, the, the current type of crisis um, that gripped uh, European Union. Now, while we were writing this book, probably we thought we were thinking that um, COVID was the culmination of crisis in Europe, but then came the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis. And we started to feel more and more the impact of the climate change as yet another crisis uh, on, on European politics. So we were perhaps in terms of our reflections, we were rather optimistic that um, mm -hmm. you know this, this must have been, and you know, there are some uh, reflections in the book in terms of the governance of the COVID crisis in Europe. And I think in the retrospective, I think that they were rather uh, in the baby steps <laughs> to approach how crisis uh, can be handled. Uh, in Europe, because the current crisis that that Europe is facing is way beyond the crisis that 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 we have come we have seen thus far. Um, what we see now is uh, the uh, this impressive hike uh, in energy prices, a, a war that's happening at at, at European borders, um, which is leading to a certain trauma in the European mindset. Um, thus far, wars um, or civil wars or refugee crises, um, well, maybe actually with the, with, uh, with the exception of the war in Yugoslavia, have happened at faraway places whereby the Europeans did not necessarily or could not necessarily connect themselves, neither ethnically nor culturally um, nor geographically. And then uh, they, they saw uh, the impact and effect of these wars on, on their politics, but I mean, through the means of the media. Most of the time, um, it is the traditional media sources, that is the TV and their newspapers, et cetera. And you know, probably the overwhelming discourse of like four years, right? But I mean, now, uh, since, the, since the beginning of war in Ukraine, the Europeans are seeing uh, for the first time, let's say since the Yugoslav crisis, uh, that people who look like them and people who are at their, at their immediate borders are, are going through a war that Europeans would have associated otherwise with other places and with the, with the trajectories of um, the experiences of, of, of the other. On top of everything, this war uh, is happening uh, right, uh, right next to uh, the Eastern European countries who, who, are, who have taken it for granted that now that they joined the European Union, um, they are almost living the life of a Swede. Right, because they can get their passport, they can get on a Ryanair plane, they can go anywhere, go to Germany, work there a few few months, perhaps spend some time, etc. So, the, the the generation, the the parents' generation, they say, or or else uh, the generation before them, had this kind of resilience against crisis in these countries because they went through communism, they went through you know the Hungarian uprising, the Czechoslovak, uh, Czechoslovak the, the Prague Spring, um, of the Soldarność movements, et cetera, and various movements in, in Romania and regime change and all that. But um, the current generation in Eastern European countries, they lost this, this resilience because they are born into European Union and then they took it for granted, the solidarity, stability, and then you know, prosperity as the future uh, of their countries. So I believe the trauma that, that, that is uh, gripping these countries and the nations of these countries will be much, much worse than the West European countries as they found themselves once again in a very liminal situation in between what they conceive and what they consider as a stable and secure Europe and the insecure East. And not only that, you know, uh, although there had been some wars in the Caucasus, in, in Georgia, the invasion of the Russian invasion of Georgia, um, uh, instability in Belarus, but I mean there is a, a distinctive sense of belongingness between not only the West Europeans but also East Europeans with the Ukrainians. This is very interesting. 
because thus far, um, the, the countries, the nations from Eastern Europe, they would have uh, looked down at you know, the, the Russian sphere, the Orthodox Russian sphere, in terms of in terms of a different type of engagement. But there is a consistent consistent belief that um, the Ukrainians they they really represent the true European. So they feel that their extended self, let's say, has faced this danger, this challenge, and that the South itself in, in Europe is also facing this challenge. And I think you know, beyond the crisis, the trauma that this has created, it is going to be very, very interesting to see in terms of the future of the European Union, how Europe, what, what will become of Europe. Will, will it really make Europe perhaps a lot more open? Because they will now understand that their extended South has been exposed to all those uh, threats, dangers, you know, wars and at attacks and killings that um, they, they thus far have thought the problem of the others, right? Or will it really make them a lot more defensive when they see the material impacts of the war in Ukraine in terms of the energy prices, in terms of insecurity, in terms of increased military spending at the cost of other things uh, that, that, that have defined post-material politics so far? And that is that going to turn into a resentment to the liberal elite? Now, there are certainly some political forces out there, and in Hungary is the place where I know the best, obviously. Um, Viktor Orban doesn't think that the war in Ukraine is going anywhere, and he says that you know, Russia, is, Russia is winning, Russia will win. It is, it is very clear. Um, all we have to do is that you know, we have to negotiate with Russia because the more this thing drags, the, the worse our situation will be. And those types uh, will always be there. But I was listening to Jeffrey Sachs. That was very interesting. A few weeks back uh, at, at a lecture that he gave uh, at the Wise Center at, at my university at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, it, was, it was a lecture on care. Uh, and obviously, we would all agree you know, certain things about the care economy, that care workers, they should be paid. Um, and then the care workers, they should support and all that. So this is how he started uh, his lecture. And there was nothing controversial there. But I mean, at some stage, you cannot say much about care because people agree on <laughs> these things. After all, there's nothing controversial. And it was right, right during uh, the, uh, the UN uh, General Council meetings. And probably he was party to quite a few discussions and debates over there. And you know, he shifted the course of discussion. He said that you know, we have to negotiate with, with Putin. Uh, because the longer this war goes on, the worse it's going to be, particularly for, for, the, for the countries in Africa. Um, there's poverty, there is energy poverty, uh, there are increasing prices in food, food insecurity, and all that. I mean, it's inevitable that we will have to negotiate uh, with Russia. Now, considering the focus of this book, and that is the crisis that, that hit liberal integration, a liberal course of integration in Europe, and how uh, it has created this kind of a challenge to cosmopolitanism, I think this is also very, very telling because I mean, you would imagine Jeffrey Sachs to be the, the voice of you know, liberal, uh, liberal ideology or, 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 or the liberal West, even if he's not European. Um, that doesn't matter. But um, if, 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 a, if a face of liberalism and li liberalization is saying that we have to engage with, 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 with Putin, it goes to show that perhaps um, the, the ideological um, uh, alliances and the ideological definitions of how the course of inter uh, international relations and integration should operate must be changing at the face of an imminent threat and the trauma that it creates. Mm. So I'm quite interested actually how the trauma not only shakes the root uh, of, uh, of our politics, but also enforces us in, in some kind of an insecurity that would make us support politicians and political ideas that we wouldn't have supported otherwise. Because at the face of trauma and insecurity, you always look for some kind of an imminent stability around you. And if that, if that, if that very self and very, uh, uh, your very sphere had been um, encroached upon, let's say, by an outsider, then I believe that that, that becomes time for you to drop all these you know, grand ideals. Uh, about cosmopolitanism in, uh, for uh, for this book, at least, and to protect your your imminent uh, imminent safety, you you would you may be attracted to some political ideas that you wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, let's talk about Weimar Germany, right? Uh, for that matter, and how things gone already. I don't know. I mean, this is something that we have to watch. How the war in Ukraine is going to affect a liberal paradigm, 
and whether the trauma that it has created it, it, is it going to make it a lot more reactionary um, considering um, uh, the, the impact of uh, of various social movements um, and, and rights and freedom uh, kind of agenda. Uh, is it going to make it uh, a lot more reactive? Is it going to make it a lot more defensive? Will the Europeans now see that um, they, in fact, they are not too different from uh, uh, the, the people that they consider as the other now that their security is challenged? Or is it going to make them question this, this whole liberal agenda and will make them a lot more defensive because now they see that they are you know, being challenged and the trauma itself is very, very prone to uh, lead to uh, certain political reactions that they wouldn't have they wouldn't have shown otherwise. So, I mean, that's, I think, where I should leave. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, well, I have a couple questions, but maybe others. Yeah. Thank you. This is fascinating. I was um, I was thinking that going to starting from the last things that you said, maybe in a purely Schmittian way. How I wonder how this idea of cosmopolitan Europe as 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 the Europe that absorbs, as you say in the introduction to the book, the fifth column, the Muslims are threatening us. How does it affect the idea of cosmopolitan Europe that, let's say, Habermas was talking about 20 years ago when cosmopolitan was about the internal migration and the differences mm -hmm. between, not even only between Western and Eastern Europe, but just even in Western Europe, how these countries contested the whole idea that would be more than just a legal and just a, 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 a neo-functionalist model and nothing more than that. These threats perceived threats of migrants, but now even maybe more existential threats, more real, physical, maybe nuclear threats. Do you observe that it affects positively the idea of the solidification of Europe as more of a maybe federation or as Europeans understanding that they have more in common than they used to think earlier? That is how they confront this external enemy, how it affects their own identity as Europeans. I mean, this is a very pertinent question, obviously, but um, it all relates to when I also started from this material versus post-material politics, right? Because when there's prosperity, post-material politics, you know, sets the, sets the tone of the day. That's why post-material politics came in, in Western Europe in 1960s, 1970s, when uh, European countries, they reached a certain level of prosperity. And that becomes a time when you can talk about um, rights, freedoms, you know, anti uh, nuclear uh, weapons and uh, demilitarization and all that. But when there are, uh, however, whenever there had been an existential threat to the course of European integration, nationalism always set the tone of the debate. I, don't, I mean, you, you would remember uh, uh, how uh, the EU institutions have attacked Greece um, during, uh, during the Eurozone crisis, and no one really raised the issue that, I mean, yes, okay, these people, they borrowed money, but the I mean, lender also has a responsibility. So the lender should have been responsible, and the lenders have been completely responsible to give to give cheap credit. And in fact, it was the borrowers who were who were forced to pay for the irresponsibility, well, partially responsibility of the lender, uh, in order to save the West uh, European banks, right? So, um, and then now what we're seeing is this huge, big uh, uh, German energy package package. Um, around 200 billion uh, euros to protect uh, the German companies vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the hike and increase in, in energy prices. And this is happening you know, within, uh, within, within the single market. So all of a sudden, you know, one of the main tenets of single market is the fact that the state cannot really protect uh, their companies because everyone should be trading, everyone should be you know, carrying out um, their existence uh, in more or less um, equitable terms in all these countries. A rich country is saying, well, hang on, I'm, I'm going to give a 200 billion support to my companies so that, that they can mediate um, the energy hike and that they wouldn't collapse, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is uh, completely unreasonable. Everyone's saying that this is unreasonable. You cannot really do that because we need to have a common European agenda in order to protect our companies so that you know, the common market should operate in equitable terms, Germans are saying, well, we're just going to do that. And that their uh, justification is very similar to the justification that they had during the Eurozone crisis. That is, if Germany collapses, 
then the whole Europe is going to collapse, right? So during the Eurozone crisis, if, if the German banks collapse, then the whole Europe will collapse, okay? So um, there's, a, there's a continuity here. Whenever you see a crisis, I'm, to, I'm going to talk about the economic crisis here, immediately there's a turn to, to more protectionist region. But I mean, this is understandable. This is international relations, right? So the ideals and the norms, they relate to a, to a world of prosperity. If there's no prosperity, then the nationalism and defense mechanisms in economics will immediately set the terms of the day. This is extremely, extremely understandable. I can't criticize this thing because that's how international relations operate after all. So the Hadarmesian once again ideas, they were written in, in, in times of uh, prosperity, in terms of hope, in terms of um, you know, the imminent uh, enlargement to, uh, to Eastern Europe. And when uh, enlargement to Southern Europe um, uh, was considered as a big success story, where uh, during the time of, let's say, consociational democracy, this kind of stable European political party systems where you will know who, who, who you will get. And there were not really many surprises. I mean, in fact, Habermas writes about, it comes all the way from this European cafe culture, right? And all this like deliberation. And um, this is a very bourgeois kind of approach and understanding of how day-to-day -day politics work. But I mean, the way day-to-day -day politics work nowadays is, has nothing to do with this cafe culture anywhere. This is, uh, this is an idealization by people like Orban, and the idealization goes all the way to you know, very traditional gender roles, very traditional um, uh, kind of family structures, uh, very traditional understanding of who belongs and who's an outsider, et cetera. So yes, I mean, they were, they are good ideas. You can, you can read them as you know, an intellectual masturbation, really, to satisfy yourself. But um, in terms of its relevance, I don't, I don't think it is relevant any longer. I think what is a lot more relevant is um, what you hear when, when you go out the street and see how people experience Europe in their lives now. And the experience of an outsider without an e-passport is the fact that they have to deal with the visa. I, I mean, the, the, the only face that the outsider sees from European Union is the visa. That, that there's nothing beyond that. The Schengen visa, I mean, Schengen is a beautiful town in Luxembourg, right? And what do you see? Schengen is just associated with this, you know, terrible regime that you have to bring, I don't know how many papers, and then you're, you're dealing with some civil servants who, who have no interest in you. Like, why you, why you have to do this trip? You know, why you think that um, this trip is going to, to help you, to, to make you prosper, to see your friends, etc. No, you know, you're missing this document from uh, your employer, even if you show. Yeah? Um, well, that's, not, that's not a European problem. That's that, there, there are no countries in the world where that's not the case. I mean, uh, well, uh, Americans, they give you a 10 year visa. Uh, I mean, you go it's through not this, quite that easy. You, you, uh, you go through this and then you take a three day visa. To, to maybe to go visit, but you can visit France with a you know with a ninety day tourist visa. Well, a tourist visa is at the moment there is there's twenty percent rejection for Turkish citizens, twenty percent rejection. And so, there's no rejection in other countries. I mean, there could be rejections, but I mean, when let's say when Americans give you a visa, they give you a ten year visa. So you yeah, don't have to you don't have to deal with you don't have to deal with this visa every six months to take a three day visa. But I mean, the other thing is that America does not really have this pretensions of building a cosmopolitan liberal sphere, right? I mean, America is America. So other countries, you know, Russia does not have this pretensions, yeah. But Europe has. I mean, we're talking about Europe here and the external face of Europe, but I'm saying is the fact that you have to deal with this visa thing. And that really determines the course of how you engage with European Union, unfortunately. Yes, I'm Britain, yeah. It is very difficult to get into Britain. I understand, but I mean, Europe doesn't, Britain does not have this. In Pretensions. You don't think Britain has the pretensions of being a liberal cosmopolitan state? But it is not a you know, conglomeration of 27 countries. Well, it's only three now, but you know, four. It, or more. Four. Yeah. But I mean, it, 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 is a lot, it is a lot more different than the European Union. What I'm saying is that the day to day engagement of people with politics is not really Habermas any longer. It's simply how they experience Europe on the street. And if you're an outsider with, with a non EU passport, the way you, you engage with this thing is the fact that um, you are, you, you need to take a visa, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah. yeah. But Justin, do you have a question? I just wondering, one of the contributors, um, or maybe more, uh, 
working on spatial planning. Is that what you said? Sorry? We are working on spatial planning. That... Yeah, we have we have geographers, yes. Could you say a word about uh, those contributions or oh yes, of course. Or... Yeah. Um so we uh, in, in from Austria we had Ursta Regar and then uh, we have uh, um uh, another colleague and uh, they are geographers and they are based in um in the in the academy of sciences uh in Austria. So their approach to, to this was to, to read the city, to see how people experience uh, Europe in terms of migrants and non-migrants uh, kind of engagements. So um, they've been doing some work, not only for the response project, but also for world power, and now for uh, the DRAD project as we're leading. And then they see various instances of everyday involvement of uh, migrants and, and non-migrants. Now, in terms of this book, they looked into the post-refugee crisis and how it affected identification with European integration in, in the city, uh, some, somewhere like Vienna. So that was their work. Um, I had a quick, there was just, there was a comment in the chat about the mic. For some reason, they couldn't hear you very well and they could hear okay. me, which is very strange. Um, I guess my question would, would be, uh, um, I'm thinking about the social, uh, the, the political and social movement um, literature that, that I've seen recently that is essentially arguing that broadly speaking, social and political movements do not emerge out of crisis, they actually can emerge in moments when states are solidifying. And in, in, a, in a sort of broader spectrum, what, you, what can emerge then is an actual solidification of, of a regime through social and, uh, and political contestation. And so what I'm wondering is, in your mind, contesting cosmopolitan Europe is this a story in some ways about reinforcing uh, a new European Union, or is this a story uh, it's to the end of perhaps a more um, of a liberal cosmopolitan uh, vision of Europe in which Europe was actually had uh, was was faced with a series of crises that it really had a very difficult time managing to a new kind of Europe that is actually in some ways much stronger and perhaps more, more coercive and, and, and sort of perhaps more on the road to a traditional notion of statehood. Um, or are you thinking of this as contesting cosmopolitan Europe, a weakening of Europe, a kind of beginning of a, of a, of, of a dissolution of the European project? I'm sort of trying to get a sense of, of how you. No, I don't that. see this uh, this solution of the European project. I mean, what I what I'm seeing here is that European project will become more and more an elite guided integration model mm. based on um, more rational ideas rather than humanitarian focus, um, based on more pragmatic and pra practical response structure rather than what uh, Roma was saying in terms of the Habermasian kind of approach. A more idealistic, let's say. So, I mean, I don't think that is going to lead to a, a, a dissolution of European Union. In fact, if you look at the course of response thus far from European Union to war to the war in Russia, and they've been very pragmatically and very practically giving coming up with one uh, kind of uh, um, embargo after another on on various uh, Russian instruments. So, it, it is working. I mean, no one can say that it's not really working. But what we raise in this book is that. If, if the European idea was to build this European public sphere and then to engage citizenry uh, in this European public sphere and then to, to build a, a Europe of ideals, you know, more and more this is going you know, way beyond that because this has become Europe of, uh, uh, of the elite um, that is doing, let's say, like a philosopher think, what they think is good for the course of integration. Uh, of European Union. So they are guided now by uh, a, a type of course of integration that they believe to, to be true and which will deliver rather than a more idealist, you know, more humanitarian Europe that was that was the case in, in early 2000s. I mean, I and this the second part of, so that the, uh, no, that makes perfect sense to me. I guess the second part of my question is, is a little bit more polemical, so you'll, yeah. you'll forgive me. But there is, there's a part of what I'm hearing in your, which sounds 
which no longer sounds like a critique of, of Europe. It sounds like everything you would have heard during the Brexit debates about how horrible the yeah. European Union is. So I guess, and I know you have a chapter on Brexit. It's, uh, I, I was able to read just a, a piece of it. But so I guess the, the, the question that would emerge out of that is, do you is is this a is this a critique of the European project as it now stands in in sort of Brexit terms? That is, look, this project has proven to be contradictory and ultimately morally bankrupt, uh, and the contesting cosmopolitan Europe demonstrates that Euroscepticism is actually quite well founded. Mm -hmm. Or is it a claim sort of from the inside, let's say uh, a sort of oppositional position in Hungary saying, Europe isn't delivering against Hungary, it needs to be stronger, it needs to be living up to its, uh, to its ideals, and, uh, and, and we need to be, we need to get back on track with, with where we were and a, and a greater process of cosmopolitan integration or liberal cosmopolitanism. Not that you necessarily have to fall on one or the other, but I'm, I'm, it's just that if one abstracts out a little bit, sometimes what it sounds like you're saying is this is just a bunch of European bureaucrats double talking and telling us what to do. Well, um, I mean, Brexit was a complete manipulation of the public vote that happens in a country that was not really used to having referendum, referenda, and there was there was no informed opinion. It was a you know a, a political joke and an act of populism. So you cannot really compare, okay. um, you know, the line of like decades long skepticism around the, the course of European integration with um, a political manipulation missionary like like Brexit. I mean, in fact, politics have become so polarized <laughs> that um, in your mind, when I raise a critical opinion about Europe, you need to think that it is within the terms of uh, of Brexit. But I mean, talking about Europe critically does not necessarily mean that you know, you're going to believe that you will leave uh, the European Union and immediately every day the NHS. No, but that's why I'm asking: is it sort of a critique from within some of your work on Hungary, where you would where you would be saying, "Look, European Europe is not doing what it needs to yeah. do for Hungary," or are you positioning yourself sort of as a critic of the project? That that's what I'm trying. But to... I mean, personally, I don't believe uh, in that. I mean, I don't believe in European Union. I never really believed in. Europe. Because you look into the shape of the common market, market and how it operates, common market has just turned into an exploitative mechanism. No, that that and this is no one really talks about this. No one talked about some Brexit, etc. Uh, or maybe rarely people talked about it. Simply, you take people who are educated from Eastern Europe and now you put them in Western Europe, right, in better paid but low skilled jobs, right? Another thing is that you're reading uh, these people uh, from, uh, well, you're reading the countries where these people were born of the talent, and you create this brain drain, right? I mean, you look at the number of, let's say, doctors, engineers, nurses, the care, caregivers, caregivers, care workers, etc., that moved from Eastern Europe uh, to Western Europe, and now you will see the course of brain drain. I was in, 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 in Latvia in 2004 for a conference. It was right after they joined uh, the European Union. And no, they were just saying that we're just going to become a colony because of uh, of the common market, because of free circulation of labor, and because of the fact that our salaries can never really match the salaries that uh, we would we would get uh, in European Union. All these talented people are going to leave, and what happened? Yes, they left, right? So it, I mean, if you have a mechanism as such that always makes the rich countries prosper. How can you really not criticize you know, an instrument like common market? Now you can approach common market and say that, well, okay, I mean, uh, some some workforce from these countries they left, right? But I mean, in return to that, their their companies they they increase their trade uh, with with the rest of Europe, and then they're receiving you know, regional aid, etc. So ultimately, you know, common market is not necessarily free circulation of labor, but free circulation of, of capital, uh, of trade, and etc. So like, if you look at the overall picture. Right. So even if the countries they lost this workforce, that there has been some brain drain, they are all on the course of prosperity. Yes, but European Union has been constructed for rich countries, with countries with more equal kind of economic development structures. It was not. It was not. It was never brought together for such you know disparity in terms of an equality in terms of the economic structures. You know GDP levels. 
um, productivity and, and all that. So following you know, this course of liberal course of integration and then expecting that you know, um, amidst all such inequality and such disparity in terms of development, you would still have a well-delivering common market. I think it is very, very optimistic. And, um, you know, Hungary joined the European Union, uh, and then you would have you would have been able to buy um, milk coming from Austria or Italy for much less than the milk that you would have you were you were producing in Hungary, for example, right? Like twenty percent, thirty percent less, same milk, right? And this was going to happen to happen for five more years because they could not join common agricultural policy immediately. Okay, so what happens in five years' time? You know, the companies that sell their milk for much less than the other companies, they just buy the market. You know, you don't really go into the countries to invest any longer, you just buy the market and the companies and et cetera. Well, yes, a lot of investment have gone to these countries. I mean, you cannot really underestimate the, the sheer level of investment places like Slovenia, Romania have received uh, in terms of manufacturing, you know, there have been all those manufacturing um, areas uh, in these countries. And yes, I mean, there have been investment in these places. But these countries have very high GDP to this course. So inequality had not really been mediated as a result of European uh, integration. Now, I mean, I, I don't really talk here like for, as, as a Brexit there, I mean, because as I said, that was complete manipulation. But um, you cannot really, you know, classify any kind of doubt or any kind of skepticism about European integration and simply, you know, this resonates as, as Brexit. Because on Brexit, they said everything, the whole idea was to get votes. And it was a, it was it was a, it was a machinery for the elite within the conservative party to establish themselves so that you know they can reach to the climax of British politics and they can control British politics. Um, but I mean, no, no, it's it's really just a question. I was using that as I was sort of identifying two uh, extreme positions. But essentially, is this a critique from the inside or from the outside in some ways? Well, I'm an outsider. Like I mean, I was born as an outsider. I live in an outside country. So I've always been an outsider, right, to, to, the, to the European Union. So I don't, I, mean, I don't, necess I'm not in a position to ever have an insider critique. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't particularly feel that way either. But I mean, obviously, you can say that I'm a rather privileged outsider. Um, and I, you know, I don't really, I'm not an irregular migrant and, and all that. So I also need to you know, step back a bit. Um, and if you feel the subject of tone here, perhaps I'm trying to resonate uh, the opinion of the, the, the unprivileged uh, outsiders. So there's no way how I, can, how I would compare my experience with uh, someone who's an irregular migrant in any of these countries. Can I, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. Um... A, a dumb question. So, it, what's the, solidifying Europe more, federating it, would change something? So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as you speak, and I, I perfectly agree with you with the inequality and the focus on free movement of labor rather than other parameters of inequality. Let's take the US or just within one country. So, when there is more and less industrialized region and there is free movement of labor, I don't know, from south to the north. What would change in Europe had it been more confederated or had been more uh, centralized political government? Would it change for the better or this is not what you are envisioning? Because the same, same problems appear in a federation, right? In the United States, even within countries, even let's say in Germany, are more and less invested, uh, regions are invested in by the federal or central government. Um, I think you know the the, the structural and regional uh, uh, policies and aid structures of European Union are e extremely important in order to uh, erase uh, regional inequalities. So European Union um, uh, actually, I mean, sends their money and invests in in underdeveloped regions. There's all that not structured, etc. Um, in order to build capacity uh, in poorer regions. Um, one cannot really doubt that. Um, uh, but I mean, when you look at places like Hungary, for example, uh, it is um, it is uh, the usual suspects that are associated with uh, with the regime that get the biggest share uh, of these uh, structural aids. Um, so when it comes to delivery, there are inconsistencies. Um, so one cannot really underestimate the fact that 
you know, these are good uh, in order to build a, a Europe more in harmony. And now you look at countries such as Greece that have been in the European Union for many decades and have been recipients of all these uh, financial instruments. And now you see that um, uh, under development still persists and then there's still a level of disparity in terms of economic development and all that. Now, if you ask me whether a confederal or a federal Europe uh, could have been a solution, I mean, I would imagine yes, but I'm not for the whole European continent. Um, I, I imagine, I, I think that uh, the EU enlargement had been very haphazard and very ad hoc in the aftermath of the Cold War, especially. Um, when you look at the, the European Union, you know, it started as a European Economic Community, right, around the six countries that were more or less, with the exception of Southern Italy, let's say, um, uh, at, an, at an equitable uh, development level. And then um, they looked at countries such as Britain, you know, such as Denmark and you know, Ireland, etc. But there were some issues going on, right? But the first, actually, the first thing that European elite had done immediately in the aftermath of the uh, European Coal and Steel Community was to look at markets. And the first countries that uh, then European Coal and uh, Steel Community approached were Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, because they were the markets. So just like any other capitalist institu institution and, and, and instrument, they were immediately looking at, you know, what is the next market, right? Because if these countries had joined, I mean, some of them joined, obviously Turkey had, uh, hasn't joined, uh, then once again, you are buying the market of these countries. And then these countries are offering like huge big expansive space for you to sell your product, right? So from the very beginning, I don't think that the European elite had really believed too much into a federal or you know, confederal Europe, because had that been their idea, they could have simply boosted the political structures of the six countries, or well, maybe had you know, included Scandinavian countries and all that, which were at more or less you know, similar um, economic level, and then they could have established the federal Europe rather than looking beyond you know, what is the next market. I mean, why Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, then? They were the only more or less democratic countries, right? Um, in Spain and Portugal, as you know, it was the military regimes. Uh, Eastern Europe was a different story. The Scandinavians, they were, they, 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 they did not have much of an interest. And Britain uh, was rejected three times. Uh, by France. So after 1973, when after Britain has joined, um, you start to see a different uh, instrumentalization of European Union because if Britain's in, it will immediately become a trade and commercial kind of a union, right? Because if you look at British uh, British history, British diplomatic history, it's a, it's a nation of trade. So their only focus has been how to build a single market around, you know, um, uh, like the maintenance of, of international trade rather than investing in European federalism and then perhaps building this, uh, uh, this, this European state. So I believe that that was a critical point, you know, not only that um, Europe's out to, to the markets, right, but also Britain joining the European Union, whereby you know, this whole federal and confederal idea starts to have a step back, and then uh, this uh, uh, more economic uh, economic oriented idea started to shape the course of uh, integration okay because then onwards right so uh, what is the what is the next uh, uh, enlargement it is to three four but um uh, completely open markets that is Greece Spain and Portugal okay yeah out of these countries Spain had an industrial structure yes and as we see now actually Spain had had come to a rather comparable uh, situation with the rest of West European countries, but with the exception of, uh, of Spain uh, and certain parts of Spain, obviously, the other countries, they do not have any industrial base that would have competed. They just turned into markets. And the reason why, in fact, we, we faced the Greek crisis in 2008 was the whole disparity in terms of this uh, economic uh, uh, levels of development between Greece and the rest effectively. And as I was saying, actually, you cannot always say that well, it was the Greeks, it was their wrongdoing and all that, right? It was the Western banks that gave them all this money. So they did not really assume any responsibility in terms of Greece, you know, failing after 30 years of being in the European Union and the fact that it could not have become an industrial competitive uh, country. And Greece onwards, yes, we have this enlargement to uh, Austria, uh, Finland, and Sweden, right? But um, that was 15 countries. Now, maybe 15 countries, that could also be a chance for them to step back 
and then to invest in, in federal and confederate structures and etc to be perhaps to build a more homogenous uh, European Union. But the lure of markets did not really stop because there was this huge big space in Eastern Europe that was sensitively very willing to join the European Union and then to open, the, open their markets. In any case, during the Enlargement negotiations, if any country was you know, trying to negotiate um, perhaps a more paced out opening their markets, they were immediately branded as being you know, semi-democratic, uh, being EU skeptic, et cetera, or being too nationalist and all that. And the only thing, after all, the, the, the European Union had agreed was, uh, in terms of protectionism, was a sale of property in Malta. Because, of, I mean, the Maltese basically that look very small little nation here, and if everyone just moves in here and if they start buying property here, then our property prices are just going to become so expensive and we wouldn't be able to uh, afford that, right? So, I mean, yes, you have a very sensible question, but I think, you know, that was a goal that could have been a goal many, many years ago, but I think Europe has missed, missed that chance already. Now, if they are going to pursue that, that course of uh, integration, I think before that they will have to, they, they have to in, invest so much more extensively in order to build a more coherent kind of economic structure around uh, the common market before they can go back to their more idealistic, you know, the post-material politics, if you will, um, and then to build uh, their integration around a, a, federal, uh, a federal Europe. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is very unlikely. I wonder if anybody online has a question. <clears throat> uh, Mihai, uh, Mihai. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, do you, do you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yeah, so, thanks, thanks, Umut and uh, and Steve uh, for this uh, lively lively debate and exchange. Um, I, I was wondering a bit whether in in, book you also, in the book you also covered the local reactions. Um, so, whether you can whether it, it tells something about. Um, I mean, I'm a bit biased here and asking directly about reactions in uh, in, in Eastern Europe. I'm st I'm also stuck a bit with the Latvian uh, example Umut you gave. Yeah. So when talking about contesting Europe, whether you also cover possible reactions there, it, it just felt so so passive in a way. What you what you said about about Latvia. Okay, so we'll become a colony, but that but you also said that 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 was what you heard a long time ago. And in the other on the other hand, uh, you know we have. We have some reactions to that, yes. So we've had a lot of uh, hot blood go into into debates about about Europe ultimately and quality within Europe. If you remember the the um, standards uh, of product debate, yes. So pushed by the Guardian and a few other, I mean, discovered, yes, about the different quality of of products. That was one of the first things that came up as a as a big one, big issue, uniting the front of. Some of the people that you cover in the book, as I saw, yeah, so you have a chapter on on Orban, I think, Kumu, that, um Do you cover that? Do you see there? And the, if yes, the question would be there. Do you see um, Do you see a pattern emerging? So Orban is an is an outlier, yeah. So at least that's how I see him. Um, I think this is a very good question, Mihai. Thanks very much, and it's a very interesting as well. Um, during my my research on Orban, uh, not only for response but in my other writings, I I, I never said that Orban is anti-Europe. So Orban simply believes that um, European course of integration has just veered away from the Judeo-Christian roots of, of Europe, European civilization, etc. And what the liberal West, the, the liberal Commission elite had been imposed uh, had been imposing on. Uh, the course of European integration is simply anti-European. He uh, he's he's against the he's against the West, but he's not anti he's not against Europe. So he may, he puts it very clear. He says that um, the course of European integration that's organized by by the liberal elite uh, is simply wrong. He says we should turn back to our roots. We should turn back to our Christian civilization. We have to uh, approach um, the, the family structures in terms of what makes Europeans Europeans, religion, uh, traditions, and local culture, etc., within within the perspective of our European uh, civilization. So 
he's not a skeptic. He just offers an alternative shape of European integration uh, in a way that is more reliant on more traditional and Christian uh, kind of um, uh, fundamentals. Now, I mean, even uh, Erdogan talks about these things. Uh, I think yeah, I, I can talk to you. Yeah, I just dropped off. <laughs> Um, so even uh, Erdogan uh, talks about these things because Erdogan in Turkey, he also sees that you know, this is not the, the, the true Europe. Europe should, should, be, should be much different. In fact, our humanitarianism and our reception policy towards Syrians shows to the Europeans how Europe should be, right? So in a way, the demarcation in our mind in terms of who is pro-Europe and who is anti-Europe is totally wrong when we look into national politics. And that's the reason why you cannot really understand European politics only using the focus of European Union politics. You need to understand, and you still have to understand, you will have to understand you know, Europe with looking at national politics and how, how, how they function. Now, I think I was asking whether um, there was this uh, coalition uh, of resentment uh, around, uh, around, uh, around Orban's ideals. I was actually expecting that there will be a, a bigger coalition uh, that, that that was going to support Orban uh, in the in the European Union, uh, and I was very I mean I was really convinced that Italy uh, was going to be the next. Obviously, uh, Hungary and, and Poland thus far um, they cooperated uh, within the European Union within the European Council, especially to protect each other from from various sanctions. There had been some kind of a mobilization uh, within the, what they call the Michigan countries, that's Czech Republic, you know, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland, in order to show a similar face uh, to the to the Kota regime that Commission uh, was going to introduce in the aftermath of the abrupt increase in the number of irregular migrants uh, coming to Europe, right? But um, Orban did, could not really build uh, did this coalition, and, and right? Poland was actually actually this. And everything else, or more or less, they're against Hungary. I mean, you know, uh, certainly the relate right now. I mean, not, they are not with Russia. They are not against each other in terms of what they conceive as European attacks on families. Yeah, and they are they they are simply uh, in a coalition when it comes to protecting you know a traditional family structure. They're against the gender agenda, yeah. etc. But I mean, the, the war in Ukraine, and we talked about it as well. The war in Ukraine definitely created this clash, the cleavage between. Poland and Hungary, which had you know, which, which had been used to supporting each other yeah. uh, all the time. But another thing Orban says um, is the fact that Hungary had become the voice of Europeans. He says the European leaders in other places they do not listen to their citizens. They do not listen to. They do not take uh, the resentment of their citizens into into consideration. Whereas in Hungary, the citizens they have this chance but to talk to their leader to, to talk to their leader, and then he says that. Whatever the Hungarian leader says, I'm in fact translating uh, the resentment in other uh, European countries. So the way Orban does his politics, it, it's not national domestic politics. Orban yeah. believes that, I mean, maybe he's replacing Kabarmas in that sense in order <laughs> to you know, replicate um, a conservative European public sphere uh, around you know, the conservative values that he successfully yeah. uh, introduced in Hungary. So. The, the response to your question is that yes, we have. I mean, Orban has not been too successful to build this coalition of the willing uh, around his politics, but it does not necessarily mean that um, he was not able to reach out to other European uh, voters and citizens that could be, you know, in a, in a peculiar way, let's say, attracted to the shape of politics in Hungary. I mean, during the course of response, for example, we were looking at the, the Swedish debates. And Swedish Democrats then they were they were referring to Orban. They were saying that yes, true Europe is what Orban is, is doing. And then yes, no, we should. In fact, uh, to, to Jimmy Ackerman, he was saying that um, he is going to become a migrant in Hungary because that is what true Europe is about. You know, this defensive, conservative Europe rather than the liberal Europe that had been established uh, according to him uh, in Sweden at that stage. So. His ideas, they find an audience, but his politics is not really finding as big an audience as he believes, or as he, as he has so. However, we have the elections in Italy now. He's very happy with the result. In fact, Jean-Claude Juncker, he praised Orban during his time 
uh, as the president of, uh, uh, of, so he was not president, he was head of the commission, as uh, the head of commission, you know, it, we write in the book as well, that um, he was praiseful of Orban, Juncker himself. So uh, he, he's always able to create this kind of uh, coalition of the women within the European Union. And I mean, Orban is, he's going to stay there, he's not going anywhere. Um, and the more instability there is in Europe, it seems, the more, you know, Orban uh, consolidates himself in Hungarian politics. Now, if you ask me about Poland, uh, if you ask me about the uh, you know, Baltic countries, Romania, etc., I would say that they've been extremely successful in, in shaping the course of uh, Europe and European integration when it comes to security policies, when it comes to its response uh, to the war in Ukraine, and uh, they, they really punched about, about its weight. Um, uh, the Baltic countries, led by mostly uh, Estonia, um, finding uh, uh, natural allies for itself in Finland, uh, in Poland, etc., and in Latvia and Lithuania, etc. But I mean, they started building uh, this kind of a uh, you know, willing coalition, let's say, way beyond the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but um, uh, amidst all the uh, instability in, in, in Belarus, right? But it doesn't mean that these countries are, are humanitarian. I mean, just a few months before the war in Ukraine, uh, I, I wrote a piece looking at the Belarusian Poland and Polish border and how they were treating the irregular migrants at that border. And three, four months later, you know, everyone's just uh, thinking that Poland is the most humanitarian place because it is receiving uh, it's, it's receiving Ukrainians. I mean, this is completely ridiculous. Okay. We might, uh, if there are, are there any other questions online? I think we have time for one more question and then. Uh, well, thank you very much, Umut. Thank this you. Is, uh, thank I you. should add, by the way, the book is, uh, thanks to it's Umut and book. James's uh, very hard work, the book is actually open access. So um, it's, it, which is just fantastic. So thank you for putting that open access. You have, uh, you can access it directly from the, from the website of the, of the publisher. And I guess we should just thank uh, Umut for his uh, for putting this uh, book together, bringing the debate to the table, and uh, and and leading the conversations on what future for uh, for Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see the DRAD uh, people. We'll see you soon. Okay.